a robotic platform that gives an artist the power to paint again. A student system that increased financial aid completion by 37%. A time-lapse model of the earth that visualizes climate impact for students. This is how you innovate in higher education. Shaping new ways to see the world and lead the future, resulting in real change for real people and expanding what's possible for our world. For more than 30 years, Oracle has powered innovation at colleges and universities around the globe, helping people see data in new ways, discover insights, and unlock endless possibilities. Every day, millions of students across thousands of institutions rely on the Oracle Cloud to bring teaching, learning, and research to life. The industry's most complete technology solutions are enabling colleges and universities to transform the student experience, streamline back office operations, and accelerate groundbreaking research. Oracle is dedicated to creating the platform of the future for higher education, focusing on market-leading development effort to ensure capabilities evolve at an unprecedented pace and enabling institutions to meet not just today's needs, but tomorrow's. Hi, my name is Paco Aubrey Juan, and I'm responsible for the PeopleSoft products here at Oracle. I want to welcome you to the Oracle Higher Education Virtual Summit. I also want to take a minute to acknowledge how challenging the last couple of years have been with the global pandemic. As a father of two kids that are in college, I know firsthand how hard that's been for universities, and I want to thank you for persevering through these times. It's also been a very exciting time to be a higher education customer here at Oracle. We're the only large software provider who's been able to simultaneously deliver best-in-class cloud infrastructure, technology, and applications, while at the same time, we're continuing to invest strategically in the on-premise technologies and applications that you're running today. Uh, we long ago committed to customer choice. We told you that we would support your choice of timing and path on how you get to the cloud, and we're continuing to live up to that commitment. For those of you who are running PeopleSoft, um, the commitment that we made back in 2006 to investing in the PeopleSoft products indefinitely continues to this day. Here we are in 2022, and our commitment to invest in PeopleSoft and support PeopleSoft runs through at least 2032, and likely will continue uh, well beyond that. We're making strategic investments in PeopleSoft to modernize the application, to simplify the application, uh, and to incorporate leading cloud and, and related technologies into PeopleSoft to provide more value to our customers who are currently running that. We're using technologies such as the Oracle Digital Assistant, the machine learning capabilities in the Oracle Cloud. We're incorporating uh, technologies like Kibana Analytics into people tools and into the PeopleSoft applications to provide value for our customers. And for those of you who have um, are on the later versions of people tools and are keeping current with the application images across HCM, ERP, and campus solutions. You should see those advances firsthand in the value that they're creating. We're also helping our customers that are running PeopleSoft reduce costs by optimizing PeopleSoft to run on Oracle Cloud infrastructure through the investments we're making in the PeopleSoft Cloud Manager. Um, and we have hundreds of customers that are live on uh, running their PeopleSoft solutions on Oracle Cloud infrastructure and saving significant money. Now, we're at that same time, we've also been investing very heavily for a long time in our leading Fusion Cloud applications. Our Cloud HCM, Cloud ERP, Cloud Supply Chain, Cloud CRM, and many other solutions are leaders in many of the analysts' quadrants and reports. Um, and we have tens of thousands of customers who've already made the move to our cloud applications. At the same time, we've been very committed and are very committed to the higher education industry. We have thousands of higher education customers such as yourselves um, who are running their institutions on Oracle technologies and Oracle applications. Um, as part of the commitment and the desire for us to remain a strategic partner for you into the future, um, we are, have been hard at work building out our student cloud solution. And while we've been working on providing quarterly releases of our student cloud solution, we've been hard at work getting the customers um, that are implementing that or live on that, supporting them uh, and, and helping them do that implementation and go live. We have 25 customers who are live on or implementing our, the financial aid module of our student cloud um, and are, are very successful at that. So again, it's an exciting time to be a part of uh, the Oracle family. It's an exciting time to be part of higher education here at Oracle. Um, and I want to just thank you for your business and I want to welcome you to the Higher Education Virtual Summit. 
Thank you for that welcome, Paco. And thank you all for joining Oracle's virtual summit, charting the future of higher education. I'm Liz McMillan, executive editor of Chronicle Intelligence at the Chronicle of Higher Education, and I'm your host for today's event. For those of you who have previously joined us in person for the Cloud Symposium, this year's virtual format is new. But we haven't changed the fundamental approach, bringing together diverse minds to address the important issues, trends, and challenges facing higher education. Over the next 80 or so minutes, we'll explore continuous innovation and technology-driven change at higher education institutions with thought leaders and experts, including a university president, a chief information officer, an analyst, and a student panel. We certainly have a lot of ground to cover. These past two years have been the most turbulent and dynamic I have seen in over 30 years covering higher education. As one university leader said to me in 2020, early in the pandemic, we've crammed 10 years of change into 10 weeks. Faculty, staff, and university leadership are working around the clock, and campuses have moved at lightning speed to try to meet students where they are. And yet we're still seeing students struggling with basic needs, financial issues, and sometimes leaving college altogether. Helping students of all kinds succeed in such trying circumstances is surely one of the biggest challenges facing institutions today. And speaking of change, our first interview subject has been a force for transformation and reinvention at New Jersey City University for more than a decade. Oracle's Nicole Engelbert recently sat down for a conversation with Dr. Sue Henderson to talk about how she has supported NJCU on a journey to stay relevant to a student population whose needs and expectations are changing rapidly. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. To wherever you may be out in the world, thank you for joining us today. It is a distinct honor for me, particularly as a New Yorker, to be welcoming Dr. Sue Henderson, president of New Jersey City University. Dr. Henderson has dedicated her entire career to empowering students to meet their personal, professional, and academic goals. She started her career as a, as a math teacher back in the day. With nearly 70% of her students eligible for Pell Grants, and these students representing 60 ethnicities and speaking, my goodness, 50 different languages, New Jersey City University truly embodies the vision of swinging wide the campus gates and, and transforming the lives of students and their families and even their, their communities. So I couldn't think of a better person to kind of spend kind of the next you know, 15 minutes really talking about kind of how we chart the future of, of higher education. So with that, Welcome, Dr. Henderson. Thank you so much for being with us here today. I thought maybe we'd start with your perspective on what makes New Jersey City University so very special um, and your vision for how it serves students and the community. New Jersey City University, we call it NJCU, is an institution where, as you said, almost 70% of the students are Pell eligible, which means they come from modest means. Um, and about 65% of them are immigrants or they're children of immigrants. And their diversity is incredibly rich. They're from all corners of the world. And that makes this institution incredibly special. The other piece of it that's very, very important, this institution began in about 1927 with the idea of educating teachers. Uh, it expanded very quickly to really offering a lot of relevant degrees, whether that was fire science or business or accounting. But the degrees were always focused on making sure that you took students who came from modest means and got them an opportunity to have a career, a life that would change not only the, their lives, but the lives of their families. And we have continued to do that since we've been open. And we've done that in a city that has just begun to explode. Still continuing to have a lot of immigrants here, but they're from so many different places. Where there used to be Italians and Irish and Polish, now you have people from India, you have people from 
uh, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, you have people from the Philippines, they're just from everywhere, Egyptians. It, it's been fascinating to me uh, to be working in this city that's changing so much and making such a big difference for New Jersey as well as the area. Absolutely. It's, it, in many regards, it's the American dream kind of come to life on a, on a college campus. Now, I'd be a bit remiss not commenting on kind of the, the view, the million dollar view, the billion dollar view. I'm not, I'm not quite sure kind of how to, how, to, how to quantify it kind of here. Um, but, but certainly the launching of the business school was, you know, under your tenure, something that was very important to you. Kind of how does that fit into kind of the, the vision and direction of NJCU? So NJCU has been offering a business degree since the 50s. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've talked to alums who graduated, uh, went to, uh, you know, served in World War II and then came back and, and then finished their degree in business and went off to do some amazing things. I, uh, your, your computer and mine has the Unix system in. Sure. Well, one of my alums helped create that uh, back in the day, as they say. <laughs> But uh, we knew that this part of the city, because it's right across the river from Wall Street, is known as the, as the back office of Wall Street, is where they used to do the transactions. Mm -hmm. uh, the business would close, the real estate here is cheaper, and they would do the transactions here. So what you'll find on this side of the river are all the major financial firms have offices here. And because it's, again, it makes much more sense for them to be doing that. So we have begun to try to transform what we want to do with the School of Business as we created and said, let's think about what a 21st century School of Business should look like. So it's very data driven. Mm -hmm. Whether you do management, whether you do marketing, whether you do accounting, very data driven. We have a financial technology program that was one of the first in the state, data analytics. Uh, the management program goes every, everywhere from regular management to port logistics management, which is an area of importance to us because we're the third largest port in the country. Uh, so what we're finding is we're bringing real value to this region because of the kinds of degrees we offer, um, because they're much more relevant. The faculty are really doing a lot of really cutting edge research in that area as well as the kind of students we're graduating. We graduate very diverse students and that's what the workforce needs today. So it's an exciting time to be here. <laughs> now having that precision to know kind of what a market needs, mm -hmm. um, not just in the academic programs, but how the programs are, are, are formulated and the types of graduates that will come out of that program, kind of takes a level of, I mean, could we call it kind of high performance um, capabilities of the institution. It's hard for many institutions to kind of achieve that level of precision or agility or capacity for, for innovation. You're, you're leading an institution who's doing that today. Kind of what does it, what does it take to accomplish that? So that, that's a very important question, particularly in the face of COVID. Uh, I think COVID has put a lot of strain on a lot of business, but particularly higher education. And one of the things that we've focused on here at NJCU is the idea of data-driven decision-making. Uh, now that means you better have the systems in place, uh, you better have the capacity to be able to draw data on that system and then understand what the data means and how, that can, how you can effectuate change uh, in order to be responsive to the market. Uh, serve your students, make sure that today's students are being served in a way that they need to be served, which is very different from the students 10 years ago or even five years ago. So it is about data-driven decision-making and having the systems in place to make that work. And we've worked really hard in order to put those things together in a way that's helpful to our campus community, whether it's our students, our faculty, our staff, or our alumni, in a way that also serves our community, our greater community, uh, Jersey City and the state of New Jersey better. There's one thing to put kind of tools in people's hands. Quite another for folks to know what to, what do I do with this, this amazing, amazing tool? What types of in initiatives and investments have you had to make to kind of bring your team and your community along with you on that journey? So, I've been fortunate on two fronts. I have uh, a lot of senior team me members as well as uh, mid-level managers who really love looking at data and understanding how it can impact things. 
The other thing that helps is I have a board who's very interested in knowing what the data is and can you show what your ROI is? Why is this important? How is it going to benefit? Whether that ROI is we're going to be a better community because of it or because, well, look, financially this is a very smart thing for us to do. An example of an ROI where we're going to be a better community and it's going to help us ROI financially is we're partnering with Joffrey Ballet. Now the city would love to have a professional ballet company here and Joffrey Ballet is very interested in being here in Jersey City rather than in Manhattan where they're currently located because again, it's cheaper to be here and there's a lot of opportunities and synergies for them. We are now offering their degrees and uh, they will soon be on our campus uh, doing their, their ballet here rather than doing it in the city. So that's an example where the financial numbers worked but it also helped our city in that it helped the arts. So oh, that's that's wonderful. Now, I'll certainly be kind of ringing you to find out about tickets to <laughs> student performances in in the future. But that kind of gets to to students, mm -hmm. which is that's the end game kind mm -hmm. of 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 all of this. I mean, a kind of CIO at another institution, an R1 different than NGCU, but the same same mission. She says that every dollar I can pull out of back office operations mm -hmm. is a dollar I can put against teaching and learning. And that is an, an amazing goal, mm -hmm. of course, but it's incredibly difficult to transform the student experience. Mm -hmm. It's easy to go from spinning up wonderful pilots and small programs. Mm -hmm. It's much more difficult to go from pilot to pervasive and have a sustainable improved student experience. Dr. Henderson, why is it why is it hard? And what are things institutions can do to kind of move the I don't know the proverbial needle? Mm -hmm. Glad you asked that question. We are just going through that same process of looking at how we can find administrative things and be much more efficient so that we can better serve our students. The question then becomes, how do you take those efforts, whether it's financial or people's times, energy, uh, and make it so that it serves the students in a better way? And again, it's data-driven decision-making. You know, how, how are the students doing, whether it's surveys or their grades, or what are the pain courses? All that requires a lot of uh, close attention by department chairs, by deans, by faculty members, and making sure that we're moving the needle in the right way. But it isn't just what happens in the classroom. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of data that shows it's the out of classroom experience that's far more meaningful uh, in the front end, not on the back end, but on the front end for students to getting them to stay and persist. And so working with student affairs and making sure that they are connecting all these experiences is an incredibly important thing. We're involved now with something called American Council of Education, a learner lab, and the idea is to bring a team together. These are a team of faculty, staff, and even some students who are saying, what do we need to be doing to make sure that the student experience is richer? And by a richer student experience, it's not only having, you know, a, a good time where they're learning, but they're getting the right kind of internships, that the courses they're taking that are incredibly relevant so that they're useful when they leave and that we have enough connections with industry so that we know that our degrees are something exactly what industry wants which has been fun oh that's absolutely yeah. fascinating and so well aligned i feel like the, the the research around student experience and student outcomes has, has shifted so greatly from let's personalize that student experience let's be student centric and we're going to give them this lovely personalized experience to kind of being much more how do we empower our students to be to have a student directed experience so I'm, I'm hearing that kind of emerge in the language well it is the student directed experience because if you think about it once they graduate they have to be self-directed so the <laughs> idea is help them become independent learners and they have to be self-reflective in how they're learning as well as they're experiencing life so yes, it's an important skill for students to have because again, they're gonna leave us and they will go work in a job. And they'll work in a job market where there's much more fluidity, mm -hmm. where you need to show your value, or if you're not liking what you see at the current job, you're gonna go work someplace else. So I, I think that having that self-directed learning is gonna be really important for our students. And that comes with helping uh, through, like I said, through data de decision making, but also working as a team together. Uh, I remember in one of my campuses I worked at, they called it a high-touch, high-tech. So you want to use technology, but it's also the human touch, which is important.
both are important. On our development team, we talk about how the best solution is the one that our end users never have to use. It simply creates more time and space for those end users to do what they love mm -hmm. to do, which kind of has the most impact, which of course is engaging with, with students and helping them kind of on, on their way. So we should talk about the technology. Mm -hmm. It is a technology conference. <laughs> what type of ad advice would you give to institutions about how to bring in technology so it's not a shiny toy that we kind of take, oh, look at this kind of cool kind of bit of, bit of technology, but something that actually has kind of a meaningful impact on the performance of the institution, mm -hmm. on the experience of the, of the student, on, on ultimately enabling that student to kind of reach his or her goals. My experience with technology, and I've worked in three different institutions where in each instance we were implementing technologies, the pieces that seem to work the most effectively are starting with a base, using it, figuring out what works, what doesn't work, what do we need to then now add or incorporate into it in a more fuller way. And then when you add those things on, they need to be deeply embedded into the fundamental reason why you got the first technology. And an example is uh, there's a wonderful technology that people use to track uh, alumni. Right. Well, that data needs to be connected back to the students who are currently here so that I know 10 years from now where my alumni, what they majored in, and where they're working now. And having that all incorporated in a seamless way, it ha means you must be very mindful about how you put the systems together. But that does put a level of onus on kind of you and your team to have a, a relatively built out vision mm -hmm. and a relatively built out kind of understanding of what you want your business processes to be, what you want mm -hmm. your kind of service levels to, to be. But how do you do that? I mean, as, a, as a university president, I, I suppose that the buck stops right, right here <laughs> um, with you, Dr. Henderson, but how do you go about doing that? So I would think two words, seamless, but then also deeply meaningful. Okay. So for the student, it needs to be perceived in a very seamless way. Uh, but I'd like for it to be very meaningful in that as the students experiencing this that we're getting deep meaning out of it so we better understand the effects of the things that we are doing and are they making a positive difference, no difference at all, or a negative difference. So we can adjust what we do, our behaviors, what experiences we have the students involved in so that, you know, it's a win at the end. Now, when you get that, have that access to that kind of, that kind of data, kind of it's kind of almost the good, the bad, and sometimes it's the, it's the ugly. Mm -hmm. How as a leader do you contend with kind of the cultural and kind of emotional, sometimes reluctance to grapple with the ugly? So um, I don't ever see the ugly as the ugly. I okay. just say, that, okay, we tried something and it didn't work. So we need to try something else. Yeah. And the analogy I give frequently, I said, you turn your light bulb on every, on every morning, and Thomas Edison did it wrong 1,400 times before <laughs> he finally got it right. So we just keep, need to keep working on it. Uh, and you know, you learn from the ugly. You also, okay, why did we choose to do that? What was the premise behind it? And then what didn't work about it? Excellent. It may have been it was a great premise, but we implemented it poorly. It may have been bad premise. Well, we're not gonna do that one again. So just you know, doing some analysis around it and you know, uh, adjusting that and keeping moving. Brilliant. You don't get better unless you just keep working at it. Nope, there's lots of failures <laughs> kind of before, before the success. And right. Thomas Edison in New Jersey, <laughs> a New Jersey resident um, back in the day kind of as, as well. NJCU is in, in so many ways the new modern university, mm -hmm. serving the new modern student over a lifetime. So you're doing what many institutions see at the end of their balance beam. And what type of guidance, kind of last words, recommendations, would you, would you offer the folks who are, are listening in today to, get, to either get started or perhaps to help their boat go just a little bit faster on that journey? So I think uh, all the institutions of higher education, except for a very, very short few, uh, probably experienced a lot of dramatic change over the last two years. Simply because of COVID, it helped you to really see the pain points in your organization where you might want to adjust. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this is a day where you would definitely want to be doing that with technology, uh, with data and with data-driven and artificial intelligence and data analytics to understand how much more powerfully you can make decisions based on that. And it's, I've seen it make a significant difference and you just get started. You kind of start with the greatest pain point, but keep the big picture in mind so that you build a structure um, that's much more integrated as you're moving forward. So. That is a perfect place to, <laughs> to end. Dr. Henderson, thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure to talk with you today about kind of how to build and advance the performance-driven institution, really building that kind of new modern university and serving kind of the new modern modern student. So I guess we can kind of, in some ways, kind of end where we, we started uh, with the importance of really serving our, our, our customers, being relevant, mm -hmm. speaking the same, the same language. And I want to thank everyone out in the audience today for, for joining us for this conversation about how to kind of turn the dial just a bit on being a bit more performance driven, a bit more data driven in the work that we do. Thank you. Thanks again to Dr. Henderson for spending time with us. NJCU is a compelling example of how data-driven decision-making is being harnessed to improve the student experience and better serve the community. One of the biggest challenges facing higher education today is affordability. 86% of first-time, full-time students receive some sort of financial aid. But after the precipitous drop in enrollment over the past two years, particularly at community colleges, it is clear that the challenges of truly swinging wide the campus gates are deeper and more pervasive than we might have previously imagined. In our next segment, we're going straight to the source to ask a group of students from Oracle's Student Advisory Group for some practical advice on how institutions can improve the financial aid experience in meaningful ways. Welcome to the student panel on financial aid. My name is Joyce Kim and I'm a product manager on Oracle's higher education development team. Long before I joined Oracle, I taught at the college level for five years while getting my PhD. So talking to students, not just teaching them, but listening to and learning from them is really near and dear to my heart. And that objective is also at the heart of Oracle's commitment with our customers and with our products to ensure that they are truly student centric and will meet the needs of students today, tomorrow, and well into the future. And that's why we've created the Student Advisory Group, which is the first advisory group in which we're working directly with and alongside students at schools who are using and adopting our financial aid tool, Oracle Student Financial Planning. The feedback and insights they give us, both good and bad, is directly impacting and shaping our solutions and ensuring that student financial planning will be able to support the very real challenges and alleviate the anxieties that students face when it comes to financial aid. Today's student panel includes three members from the student advisory group. Tia, Tess, and Andy all have very different backgrounds and stories relating to financial aid and the path to get them to and through college. And I'm really grateful that they are willing to share their experiences with us today. So as a first question, um, I'd love if the three of you could introduce yourself and share a bit about your school. What makes your institution so special? Hello, my name is Tess McTeague and I am a senior currently at Butler University studying management information systems. So MIS basically connects technology and the relationship it has to different organizations um, and how organizations can use technology to better their work. Um, and their decisions that they make. So for me, what makes Butler so special is besides just our incredible basketball team and our really adorable live mascot, um, is the hands-on learning experiences that Butler has provided me, as well as the resources to not only excel academically, but also in my post-graduation and professional endeavors. Well, greetings. I am Tia Huey, a fourth year health leisure fitness study student from Tallahassee, Florida. I serve as Miss 1992 with the FAMU chapter of Sisters Incorporated, Active Minds, and also Dreamers at FAMU. And I do serve as a student athletic trainer with the university's football team. And well, the first and foremost thing that makes FAMU so special is that it is the number one public HBCU. Uh, basically, it is a space for African Americans, minorities that can come, study comfortably, and succeed in places that were once made 
not for us to see in the first place. My name is Andrew Kirk, and I just graduated with an associate's degree in cybersecurity from Westchester Community College. I ended up attending Westchester after high school for performing arts. I didn't do so well in the gen ed classes, but I ended up moving on with internships in the city for audio recording and music uh, recording studios. I ended up returning years later in fall of 2018. I wanted to take learn programming in a classroom environment. I had been teaching myself at home. So I took a class uh, on object oriented programming. I learned about a cybersecurity club there. I ended up joining the club and I changed my major to cybersecurity. And now I'm going to uh, Pace University in the spring on a full ride scholarship. So I'm excited and thank you, WCC. So let's talk a bit about the financial aid experience. What are some of the challenges you or your family or your peers are facing when it comes to financial aid? Um, whether it's understanding how to apply for aid or how to receive aid or what your package entails. Um, what are some of the things that have been challenging for you or keep you up at night? The biggest challenge that I've noticed personally and among my peers is just the overall miseducation around financial aid, as well as a lack of communication when it comes to the benefits and possibilities that student have, students have when it comes to their financial aid resources. Um, so whether that be not understanding what resources are available to them, or maybe not knowing all of the steps that are required to access those resources are things that I think hold students back from getting their financial aid. Initially, when I did go to Westchester in 2005, I didn't use financial aid. But when I was returning, I was looking at all options for how I could pay for the education. I was able to Google how to get uh, opportunities in financial aid and ding, 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 the Pel federal Pell Grant was there for me because I didn't earn enough money and it was just a, uh, a gift. But when I applied, it was fairly straightforward. It was through a government website. What was a little bit uh, interesting was then the communication with the school. I did get a call on my house phone where they had to have me accept the award. And I never listen to my house calls anymore. I, I have my own cell phone. Um, but my dad told me they had called. And so I called them back and I said, I accept the award. I had to figure out what my class schedule was going to be like. And I have limited transportation. So I couldn't go full time because I'm juggling cars with family. So I had to, I asked them if some of the money could be used for transportation. It wasn't possible to use financial aid for that reason which I learned real quick. I think this leads to my next question then. What are elements of the financial aid experience that you think could be improved? Is it better, more seamless communication so you don't have to answer your house phone? Is it more transparency into what your financial aid package entails or how it can be used? Uh, what would create a better experience, student experience for you when it comes to financial aid? There was a few times where uh, I was trying to communicate back and forth with them and it was just a huge challenge. But I understand that they do have a lot of on their plate, a lot of students asking a lot of questions. I have emails that went on for months with my financial aid off uh, advisor. I found that when I wanted to focus on studying and the coursework, I was busy communicating with financial aid. So it was a slight distraction. I think once a student enters college, maybe having a discussion with the financial aid office of, these are all of the resources that you have available. These are the scholarships um, academically or athletic or whatever other type of grant or scholarship that they're receiving from the university that is available to you. Um, these are the steps that you need to take and the resources that we have. So making it as transparent and as comprehensive as possible. That's great. And Tia, you didn't mention this in your intro, but I know that you are also um, working in the financial aid office. So you have sort of a unique perspective in that you both understand financial aid from the student perspective and, you know, as someone who is a liaison and staff member communicating with parents and students about financial aid. And can you share a bit about those sort of two hats you wear? One of my main responsibilities was over orientation, presenting on financial aid, because of course you have freshmen coming, you have transfer student coming. So just letting them know of our process, 
um, as far as filling out the FAFSA, as far as what FAMU, the deadlines we have or the restrictions we have. So just going over that information to students and letting them know, you know, this is how we do things. But also, again, as a student, letting them know like, hey, I am, yes, I'm an employee, but I'm also in your shoes too. You know, these are some expenses to look for. This is how financial aid can help. These are some other expenses to look for, and this is how you can help yourself. One comment I always hear or that I always see that students make that's a little cringeworthy is how financial aid steals their money or holds their money. Um, and it's absolutely something we cannot do because if a student is eligible for something, if a student is awarded for something, that student is going to get it. However, being that it is, you know, federal money, you know, sometimes it does have to go through, I want to say like a green light system to make sure that it is money the student is supposed to be receiving or the amount of money is correct. And if at any time that the amount could be wrong, um, whether it's increased or decreased, we can't disperse it. But then, you know, it's not just family. It's just not Office of Financial Aid. You have, you know, the government side, the Department of Education side. And sometimes as a student, you know, I have a little bit more experience of calming them down or just certainly matching the language. So just trying to get them to understand like, yes, I know it's frustrating. No, I'm not trying to hold it back from you. But before I give it to you, I just want to make sure, or we just want to make sure everything is correct. So now I'd like to turn it back over to Andy and Tess for their perspective. What are some of the aspects that you think schools or staff members might not understand about how today's students experience or interact with financial aid? As a visual learner, a little more visualization of the information and the data like to show uh, how much I had utilized over a course of a semester or two, and when I was accepting an award, how that money was allocated. To me, the technologies they used, I was like learning and they weren't as intuitive as let's say some better visual graphics. The FAFSA website has better graphics, better data in terms of how much Pell Grant I've used. Butler is really great about putting on workshops and other or events for students. But the conversations that I've been having um, tend to happen with students because those are the people that as a student, I trust the most. Having it come from a student, another student is going to listen because at the end of the day, like I'm their peer, I'm going through the same thing, whether it was two years ago, last year or last week. It seems to me that the three of you by and large are really appreciative of your schools and the sense of community you've been able to find there, whether it's from your faculty members or organizations or the campus spirit at large. But what are ways in which institutions or their financial aid offices can build trust and support with their students? Students have a full schedule, whether it be going to classes or working part-time jobs or doing internships. Um, so having the time to apply for financial aid and finding those resources um, can create a lot of stress. And we're relying on our college careers to set us up for success in the future. Um, and if we don't have those resources, then we can't get the most out of the experience that we're trying to gain right now, which is a college education. I think universities need to have those conversations with students, make themselves available, whether that be um, the financial aid office or another individual that can communicate with students and provide those resources. What do you think um, would be the best mediums? Is it like in-person workshops? Is it videos that you can access and do on your own? Like what kind of training or support do you want uh, your university to be able to provide you? I think in-person trainings or videos is always something that's great for students and having something that they can maybe watch again so they can review it and see at that next point in the year where they have to submit their financial aid would be really helpful. We did have some workshops where students can come out, speak with a financial aid representative of simply how to fill out their FAFSA. Doing stuff like that with students and letting them know like we're here not just in the office but for like other things as well. 
Um, one thing I do recommend that we should do is try to do a social media aspect where we could, you know, connect with students through via Instagram, Twitter, and things of that nature to say, well, I couldn't get a hold of anybody during office times, but let me check an Instagram to see what important updates are coming up. And let me check Twitter and see like if anything has been posted about FAFSA or about financial aid or about any awards being dispersed. So just the new usage of technology, the new usage of systems and definitely being transparent when speaking with students and parents um, is definitely a good pathway that we are taking. So speaking of new technologies, both Florida a and and Butler are currently using student financial planning. Tess and Tia, can you talk about what that experience has been like, both good or bad? It is a little bit more easier and more in-depth than the other system that we had. And then also when students are coming in, are they are calling, just be a little bit more transparent on what's going on. A lot of changes in technology that we had, a lot of changes in finances coming out of COVID. So, you know, you did have a lot of students, parents calling frustrated and just taking that time to sit down and let them know like, hey, this is what's happening. This is what we're trying to do for you all. Yes, it's taking some time maybe taking longer time than usual, but just being transparent with them and letting you know, these are the changes that we're having. It's broken down in a step-by-step -step for every single um, financial aid document and process, which has been really helpful just to not be bombarded with a whole bunch of steps all at once and taking it one piece at a time. So I definitely think it's gotten easier in the sense of it's more comprehensible. I know what I'm filling out. I know each step that I need to take. I've learned what documents are needed, where, um, who I'm going to need to contact for each step moving forward, the steps that I need to take to do X, Y, and Z. And so I think over time, that process has been streamlined and it's also just more transparent in the way that it's laid out for me now. Thank you again to Tia, Tess, and Andy for giving us their perspective on financial aid. And I think there's a lot to take away from what they've shared with us. The value of leveraging new technology and tools, but never underestimating the power of personal connection, meeting students where they are and talking to them on their own terms, and providing clear guidance when and where it's necessary. We always say our goal at Oracle is to make the complex simple, and that is never more vital a goal than when it comes to financial aid. Thank you. For so many people, the reason they work in higher education is to serve students, and their voices are a source of profound inspiration. We heard three very different experiences from these students, but more generally, there seems to be a real opportunity to expand access to education by improving the communication channels around financial aid, and by demystifying what can be an opaque and frustrating process for many, and an outright barrier for some. Next up is Clara Jelenkova, who has an impressive track record maximizing the impact and utility of technology for some of the world's most complex universities, and who is on a mission to leverage those tools to drive more resources to teaching, learning, and research. She talks with Oracle's Patrick Mungovan. Welcome, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Pat Mungovan, Senior Vice President and General Manager for Oracle's North America Government and Education Business, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by a luminary in the technology space, Clara Yelenkova, CIO of Harvard University. Welcome, Clara. The impact of the pandemic uh, on education, both as a product, so sort of the, the, the delivery of education, as well as the experiential aspects of education. And thinking about that, I think, you know, directly, Clara, in your role as CIO, what are your experience and observations? Thank you. And, you know, it's a really, it's a very interesting question because one of the things that we learned was there has been a discussion, you know, ever since, you know, MOOCs burst onto the scene, whether or not we can deliver education online and how effectively. And what we have realized is that we are very efficient at, de at delivering education online save for you know special cases such as labs you know theater performances you know ballet music etc but the, there is much more to a university or educational experience than just delivering education and really what we are doing is 
a 360 holistic view of the student, not just student supports, but you know, different opportunities that students have to participate in clubs, meet people, be part of a bigger ecosystem and, you know, live independently, you know, figure out who they want to be. The more you go into undergraduate education, you know, high school, middle school, you know, K through 12, I think there's much more of a developmental process that happens in going to school that is not that, you know, where online just simply is not the same as interacting with people and being able to learn social norms and try things out. And I think that's, that's where I think the online space has not been as robust. And in some ways, it's going to be interesting to see as we come out of the pandemic, or if you will, once we embrace it as more of an endemic, to, to see what has actually happened to students and to especially young kids that have been, you know, schooled at home essentially for, you know, two years. So I speak with CIOs frequently, you know, several times a week, and each one has experienced the pandemic and sort of the challenges that they have in a, in a unique kind of set of ways. What were your experiences like as a CIO and working through some of the challenges that folks have on the education side? One thing that was that, that I was just struck by, you know, must kind of get your head a little bit above the water and, you know, take more of a 20,000 foot view is how incredibly well the technology staff and actually the technology platforms have performed. So I can tell you when I was on, you know, I was on calls and, you know, March of, you know, February, March, 2020, and people wondering, well, is the internet going to melt down, right? <laughs> and, you know, I mean, there, you know, there were articles actually asking that very question. And I think we need to step back and realize we have spent, many of us have spent 30, 40, 50 years building something. And when it came to a true test of it, it actually, you know, yes, there were complexities, but it actually delivered what it needed to deliver when people needed us most. It's astounding um, how resilient and durable both the mission and the technology has been. Not perfect by any stretch, but extremely resilient in the face of substantial complexities. When I think about cloud, one of the great differentiators is that it unlocks environments so that you know, now we're forced to be, even though I'm sitting eight miles from you, you're in Cambridge, I'm you know, outside of Cambridge, um, it's still sort of distanced by the pandemic. But what cloud allows folks to do is work from, you know, Geneva to Cambridge and Cambridge to Berkeley and Berkeley to, you know, University of Michigan and all these areas uh, and all these experts and connect folks around the world. So what do you see um, on the research side um, and, and cloud is sort of an enabler for access and collaboration? Harvard has a cloud first strategy, and I think a lot of R1 institutions do. It would be very difficult to build the global infrastructure that we need today in order to operate from within a campus, right? So that's where kind of globally span cloud infrastructure is a necessity for, you know, major research university. Um, I think the, the piece that is, that is interesting and we need to think through is we still have what is often referred to as a last mile problem. And I think it has come, it comes to forefront more in the educational space where as students in 2020, as students disperse to go home, we have realized that we controlled the educational experience within the university network, let's say. But once they went into locations that perhaps did not have the same level of internet, or maybe at home did not have the same level of internet, we were starting to introduce a different level of inequity that we never had to deal with before because within the closed campus environment, we have done a lot to kind of equalize the playing field. Every organization I speak with essentially has a cloud first strategy, um, but the reality is hybrid, right? So there's cloud first, and I've also heard cloud smart, where you know, many of the states, some of the federal agencies are starting to pursue this cloud smart, which is cloud where it makes sense, um, or cloud where there's mission capabilities to support. What's your perspective on kind of the hybrid environment and what you see within higher education? 
I think increasingly looking for capabilities to move workloads between different cloud providers. And also recognizing that, you know, the cloud is not a uniform concept, right? And there's a real difference between SaaS, PaaS, IS, you know, it's, you know and, and really being cognizant of that. And in some ways, I think, you know, it's, it's really kind of important to think through what is the workload that you're trying to move into the cloud and which cloud provider is best suited for it? The hybrid cloud strategy is a, is a more common approach. Not every cloud service provider delivers the same type of innovation in this, for the same type of workload or the same type of mission. And so I think it's really critically important that customers look at the right cloud provider for the right mission, the right workload, and then secondarily, to make sure that there's integration, there's security, there's identity, there's privacy, there's all these components, kind of another layer. And you have IaaS, PaaS, you have SaaS, but you also have this kind of fourth dimension, which is security around the whole thing, right? And, and ensuring that there's connectivity. And so I think that's, it's really important for customers to think about an enterprise identity, privacy, security strategy to connect both cloud and on-prem, so kind of the hybrid as well as multi-cloud approach. So thoughts on that? I wonder if people's computation of risk is changing after the solar winds incident, right? Because there was this kind of a control point, right? Where you, where we thought, okay, so these are the applications we run on-prem, we manage the perimeter, right? And there are two important things that have happened. One was solar winds and all of us having to now deal with third party risk, even if you are running it on prem, right? And third party risks are very complicated. And once you really think about third, third party risks on prem, it's not that different from your third party risks in the cloud, right? Uh, and the second thing is people don't Right. So all of a sudden, the perimeter that people had in their mind, right, the network perimeter, that all went out the window, quite frankly. Right. I mean, yes, you can have VPN solutions, etc. But this this new way of working that is much more blended, you know, that is is a, is really, I think, going to be difficult for people to continue to think that there's such a big difference between the security mindset that you need to have for things that you are hosting on-prem versus things that are in cloud, uh, that are hosted in the cloud. We spend thousands and thousands and thousands of man hours on security within our cloud to make sure that our customers are safe. Um, and we want our customers to understand that we bring a tremendous amount of value in that security. In fact, more secure in, in many cases, likely, and it's some debate. I think you know people will, will debate the point, but more secure than an on-prem environment, right? To to a, a, a very sophisticated attack. You know, one of the elements, and you know, this can get very complicated in higher education, is the whole data life cycle management. And you know, whether or not it's research data or even all of university data, right? And you know, and you know, sometimes when people think about kind of solutions around you know where to host their data, they are thinking about you know the storage, right? But there also there's also the the data management enablement that is really really important, and you know that if I remember correctly is another place where you guys have solutions, right? It is absolutely. And in fact, so I always say, you know, Oracle, it's SaaS, PaaS, and IaaS. Our SaaS runs on our OCI, which is our Oracle Cloud infrastructure. We have premise based capabilities, we have cloud case based capabilities. So, sort of deployment model choice. But in the end, ultimately, whether you're running in the cloud or you're running on prem, it's enterprise data management. And when I think about data management, cloud and on prem, and I think about statutory requirements, and I think about data lifecycle, I think deeply about data ownership. Who owns the data? You know, Pat, when you mentioned sensor data, I think one of the things, um, you, you, you know, you were talking earlier about identity, right? And I think that, in that another interesting element there is machine identities, right? So, you know, we, you know, a lot of the time we've always thought about identity being associated with a person, right? 
But we have, you know, with AI, you know, robotic process automation, et cetera, increasingly we are granting identities to things that um, are not human yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, right. And, and so being able to manage that, right? Yeah. Being able yeah. to manage machine identities or identities of, you know, robotic, you know, AI processes. I think that's going, that's another space, I think, that will require a different level of uh, identity proofing and identity betting than what we had thus far. But when you think about ML and what is happening just in enterprise platforms, right? Uh, with machine learning, you know, again, you know, Robert, RPA, et cetera, it, it, that is actually an incredibly rapidly developing space. And, that, you know, in, in many ways, a space where Oracle is developing quite a bit of capability. That's why I think Oracle starts with enterprise data management, because once you have that enterprise data management layer, the insights that you gain or glean from the data is what creates value. The data itself, you know, inherently doesn't contain value. It's just zeros and ones or whatever, but it's the insight that you can glean and the, the innovation that you can introduce into your business based upon those insights. As you very correctly point out, the kind of the data layer is the core layer, right? Because nobody wants to be spending time trying to, you know, match the data together, right? And, you know, you can see a, not so distant future, a place where, you know, bringing the data together can be more increasingly automated. I'd like to conclude with another personal item, which is equity, diversity, and inclusion. What's your perspective on equity, diversity, and inclusion within education? And where do you think we are on that journey now? Out of the sale of edX to, to you, there's a new nonprofit that is being stood up to really look at, amongst other things, how to make education more inclusive, how to make the opportunities more broadly available. Incredible amount of energy, but also vision is going into that. But I think we need to realize that the reason why United States has over 5,000 institutions is because it is not role of one institution to educate everybody, but it's, it is the vibrancy of the ecosystem that has made education such an equalizer, right? And so I sometimes worry a little bit about um, the, the mantra of, you know, universities are going to go out of business, et cetera, because when you're thinking about a career that a person has, and especially people that are coming out of school now, they're going to need to refresh their skills every six to 10 years and potentially completely switch careers. I see actually more demand for education in the future rather than less demand for education. So there are going to be degrees, there are going to be educational opportunities, there are going to be vendor specific trainings, right? And I think how we think about that in a more holistic way versus, you know, either or, I think is, a, is where, it's, where there's more thinking that is, that is needed. Just because it is very, very clear that without a lifelong education and a lifelong commitment to refresh of skills, it is going to be difficult to not end up in a situation of haves and have-nots and areas where people are left behind. I'm very optimistic about the future of education, very optimistic about the future of technology, and exceedingly optimistic about how those two things coalesce to create a better outcome for folks. Universities are in the business of creation, preservation of knowledge. That's what we do, right? And as as, as a society, we are facing increasing levels of threats. Being able to engage with students on how you create knowledge, how you curate information, what are trusted forces, uh, sources, what are not, how do you create a full picture of knowledge is a tremendous opportunity for universities. And, and it's going to be an educational space that we where we have the opportunity to, to really contribute in a very meaningful way. Very insightful conversation. I really appreciate uh, the time um, as well as your partnership and, and 
definitely look forward to working with you in the near future, Clara. Thank you. Absolutely, Pat. And I hope that at some point, maybe in the summer, we will get to walk around Harvard Rit Yard together and actually, you know, talk in person. I'm betting on it. <laughs> Thank you right. so much. Okay, sure. take Thank care. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Clara, for sharing your insights into how institutions can invest more of their resources on the core mission through the effective maximization of technology. In our final segment, higher education industry analyst Vicki Tambellini weighs in on what sets successful technology implementations apart and the steps colleges and universities can take to increase the likelihood that technology investments have a meaningful impact on the student experience. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce the incomparable Vicki Tambellini. She is the CEO and founder of the Tambellini Group, a preeminent IT advisory firm that serves exclusively the higher education industry. No one has sat across more tables from institutional leaders as they have grappled with really difficult decisions about their next IT investment than Vicki Tambellini. So we are in for a real treat today to learn from her about how we can all make kind of better, smarter, more strategic decisions about, about technology so that we can drive more resources and impact to teaching, learning, and research. You know, we can see how critical the student experience is kind of to, to academic outcomes. Why are institutions, you know, making the, the real college try, the real Heraclean effort, but yet we're not seeing kind of the, the dial kind of move in the ways that we'd expect in terms of kind of better enrollment, better retention, better academic kind of outcomes. Nicole, thank you for that warm introduction and for inviting me to talk with you today. And I think that the, the challenges that institutions face are certainly different based on the size and type of institution. And we're, it's always tempting to talk about higher education as if we're every institution of size and type has the same problems when really we're, we have to look at institutions differently depending on whether we're talking about a research one institution versus a, a two-year uh, community college in a rural environment versus an urban environment. So certainly every institution is not the same for every every problem. But I I know that our research shows that the one problem is the same consistently throughout recent years, and that is that the main problems that institutions struggle with aren't technology problems at all. What institutions really have to think about first is the technology decisions in context with the people and the processes that they have in place, because otherwise they make decisions that don't really serve the institution and they're not capable of organizationally uh, taking on the change that, that they think that they want to um, undertake. And one of the reasons is that there's a, a complete disconnect between what's available today and what institutions are prepared to take on. I mean, if you think about the way systems were developed mm -hmm. decades ago, which is the way most institutions are still <laughs> operating, they were developed for administrators to be able to perform their jobs better. And so that's the, that's the way people who work in higher ed are, are looking at systems typically is how can I, how can my job be easier? How can I do my job better? When, when students are looking at the interaction that they have with an institution on from the perspective of how is my experience better? How can I graduate faster? How can I get my uh, tuition paid for? How do I know that my financial aid is Right. How do I know I'm not going to run out of financial aid? How do I make sure that I'm maximizing my aid so that it's um, used in the best way possible? So in order to do that, we have to have a student-centered approach. 
And it's a very, it's a very difficult change for leadership to, to undertake. With this new technology, that change becomes kind of not an episodic kind of event where I'm implementing my technology, we're going to be able to bound kind of what change happens at my institution to kind of one where change and innovation moves to kind of a more continuous experience where, you know, it happens well before the implementation, during the implementation, and well after the technology, after the technology has been implemented as well. And what kind of advice would you give to, to institutions about how to kind of create the capacity for, for change um, that they may not have had in the past? When the discussion first begins on campus about making a significant change, the first thing people think about in the business units is that maybe they aren't going to have a job. Maybe their roles are going to be replaced by technology and that they won't be needed anymore. And that doesn't have to be the case. Efficiencies should be expected and there should be an opportunity to, to automate tasks that were previously done manually. But the requirement for people to be involved or have opportunities for more personal interaction with students and to provide better service certainly exists. So for, for the um, projects to be successful long-term, first of all, projects don't end. They don't start and end the way they did years ago because there's continuous improvement. Um, the institution now, we could be, before we could defer uh, system upgrades and system improvements. And sometimes we see that there are institutions who made decision, a decision 20 years ago and, and in many cases haven't made improvements in, in many, many years. So we, we can no longer do that once we go to a cloud-based solution because we're going to get improvements at least multiple times a year, four times a year in an Oracle environment. So we want to make sure that the business units are equipped with subject matter experts who can help us make the best decisions about what functionality is going to be best suited for the institution. And so understanding uh, where our key resources are, who is most appropriate to be trained and have that continuous opportunity is, is critical. So again, that has nothing to do with the technology. It's all about people. Ab absolutely. I mean, Vicki, it, it seems so kind of critical for the institution to be planning and building almost a, a formal structure for a, sounds kind of wonky, but like a post-cloud world for the for the institution. This is why you see kind of offices of transformation and innovation kind of pop up at places like you see that at, at Vanderbilt University, you see that at the University of Wyoming. I mean, is that advice or recommendation, a recommendation that you would give to institutions? And Vanderbilt is a terrific example of a success that I think other institutions should follow. Where we see success is where those kinds of offices, it doesn't have to be called the same thing, but the, the critical point here is that these are institutional imperatives. And we, we, we establish then from an institutional perspective that the, that the program, the process, the direction is critical for the overall institution to be successful. And, and that, the, that the, whatever decisions are made are not associated with a single person or a couple of people at the institution. So that it, when things get hard, and they will, um, if the person that made the decision leaves, that the project doesn't stop. The institutions that have been successful have, have adopted these programs and set up these kinds of offices and said, this is important to the institution. It wasn't just a CIO that said, or a, or a CFO or a provost or whoever that said, this is what I wanna do. It's something that the institution is fully behind and has leadership support and funding. Um, and that's another thing. That we that, that we see can often derail a project is if the 
funding isn't fully allocated. The institution goes forward with funding for the initial implementation and the initial fees for five years or 10 years, but they don't fund this transformation office. They don't fund the ongoing training. They don't fund the uh, ongoing funds for the professional development that goes on for subject matter experts within the departments, all the things, the change management activities, that things that support the individuals and teams that will make the long-term success of, of the institution possible. Many folks in the audience today are either having just completed a deployment, are up to their eyeballs in a deployment, or are thinking kind of about about a migration kind of to to the to the cloud. You know, what are some of the I don't know if we use like a, a, a trip analogy, not that all of us are going on lots of trips these days, but kind of what are some of the things that institutions should be kind of packing in their bag, things that they should be thinking about kind of as they plan that migration journey. Before an institution makes a technology decision, we would always advise them to think carefully about their existing culture and the outcomes that they're trying to accomplish before they think about what they need to pack for that cloud journey, so to speak. And looking carefully at how ready they are to make such a change and also to think about their ability to absorb change and the, and the timeline that they really want to absorb the amount of change that they're thinking about, their, their cultural readiness, the institutional readiness, the funding that they're going to need, and then think realistically about not just the technology that's going to be involved, but the amount of change management that they're going to have to undertake and the, the business processes that they're going to need to think about changing, as well as the other things that are going to be impacted, things like integrations, for example, data migrations, data cleanup, um, and perhaps even using best practices rather than system customizations and and the ability for an institution to adopt best practices versus making customizations. And it can sound very easy to do while in practice, in particular, the larger the organization and the more sophisticated the software that they've been using in particular. I think that the institutions that have been operating in an Oracle environment previously are going to really have to think about how they migrate to to new systems because they're going to have to make trade-offs between best practices and completely customizing every screen. And, and these are things that are important to achieve efficiencies and also to deliver better experiences. And so it's, it's something that can be rolled out it, it, you know, quite efficiently in an Oracle environment as the institution can absorb change, which is a terrific benefit, I think, in the Oracle environment and something that we know Oracle customers have asked for specifically. So I think it's critical to, for the institution to take a hard look at themselves and understand really what they are capable of accomplishing with any system. What type of guidance would you give institutions about how to really structure and approach and think about that selection process or almost the life cycle of the selection process. So ultimately they do arrive, be it six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months down the road with real tangible kind of return on, on that investment. The ideal situation is to start with why. Why, why are we doing this? Why do we want to make a change? What, what, what is the purpose? What is the vision for what we want to become as an institution? We significantly discourage 
of buying a system the same way you bought a system 20 years ago or 15 years ago. And for most institutions, it's more like 25 years ago. So we, we really discourage that kind of process. Unfortunately, we see some institutions insist on a, on a feature function comparison, which we think is um, significantly outdated. We do think that it's important to understand um, the art of the possible. Um, you know, where, where, where would you like to be? How would you like to interface with your constituents? What would you love to be able to do? How could you accomplish more with less? Wondering how um, institutions can improve their efficiencies and deliver on the promise of a better experience with technology is, is certainly critical. And, and also think about how you're gonna get through, um, I, I think in, in particular in an, in an Oracle environment, that the way that you um, do the migrations is also pretty important. It's really a, a, a strong benefit, I think, in the, in the PeopleSoft environment to be able, the migration path is certainly easier <laughs> within the Oracle family. So Vicki, I started my career in the admissions office and I always asked every, every candidate who came into my, every intrepid candidate that came into my office, is there anything else you would like to say <laughs> on behalf of your, uh, you are certainly not applying to Oracle University today. Um, but is there any other kind of parting words of, of wisdom to our, to our audience kind of as they kind of go on this, on this, this journey of transformation with, with technology and higher education? Fully understand the impact that the change is, is going to have for your people and for the institution, the top of mind. If you don't have the full funding for your project, don't do it. If you can't, you can't get uh, support for change management and support for cleaning up the data prior to starting on an implementation, you're not gonna be successful. You need to have plans for identity and access management. You need to have plans for integration services, you need to have plans for uh, and funding for contingency. You've got to have uh, the ability to have ongoing training and subject matter experts in the departments, all kinds of things that are not just your initial project budget and need to have that funding in place over a long period of time. And if you can't get that support initially, I wouldn't even think about starting a project because you won't be successful. And I think that, and, and we have you know, a team of analysts here that work on this, do this work every day. And, and we've seen it too many times uh, play out where institutions have not had this support and those are high profile failures. So I think that um, we, we can confidently <laughs> make that recommendation and, the the other the other thing I would say is that don't uh, don't be afraid to to start the journey. Um, just know that um, the minute you that you think you're ready to start, you've already started. You you've already begun the transformation. So with that, Vicki, I wanna thank you as always, wonderful, wonderful conversation. You know, kind of no question about why so many institutions have turned, turned to you and your intrepid analysts to kind of guide and support kind of their, their journeys um, to the cloud and with different technology investments. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to the audience for um, sticking with us during this really um, fantastic and insightful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki, for your perspective on the importance of change management in transformation projects. 
Your encouragement to start by socializing the need for change brings us full circle with the advice we heard earlier from Dr. Henderson. Don't be afraid to start by tackling a singular pain point, but keep the big picture in mind. In other words, know where you want to end up as you move forward. This brings us to the end of today's program. On behalf of Oracle, I'd like to thank all of our guests today, and a special thanks to you, the audience, for joining. We hope you came away with knowledge that will help you thrive.